Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. Uh, hey, Fat Ninja, what's going on there? Thanks for the coffee. I brought the almond milk. No, um, <laughs> creatives, community kind folks out there. This week, we are talking about humans. And today is Tips and Tricks Tuesday. So each day we have, it's kind of a weekly theme and a daily theme at the same time. <laughs> but... But uh, long story short is we're, we're talking about human beings. Now, of course, in tabletop RPGs, uh, we are more or less considering humans in a world that is fantastical, whether you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or some kind of science fiction or Victorian England or Western, doesn't matter. Uh, whatever the case may be, chances are your uh, tabletop role-playing experience will have humans plus right there'll be humans plus monsters or robots or creatures or things from other worlds or what have you uh, hordes of of goblinoids and and things of that nature we're kidding so today with tips and tricks tuesday i thought we'd go over a couple of things that we can do to basically make humans a little bit more interesting and uh without necessarily I want to say uh, breaking the rules, right? We want to make humans, in, instead of devolving into uh, humans being basically cannon fodder, uh, the humans being the typical um, damsels in distress, if you will, in your world, making them a little more effective and making uh, making humans the threat that we know that they are because basically humans are a threat in our world. So um, I have a few touchstones, a few points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, I'll bring them up now and then we'll go deeper into them as we get along into our discussion. Um, one thing is humans are not monoliths at all uh, in any way, whether it comes to, to uh, science or development, culture, religion, um, uh, <laughs> uh, language, uh, any kind of practices or, or traditions of any kind of those things. Uh, human beings are not monoliths. Now, you may have a, a leader or a dictator that people will pretend to be a monolith. Oh, they'll, they'll all be in lockstep and clap and, and cheer for, you know, the evil dictator likes to put people's heads on spikes. But uh, if given the opportunity or chance or freedom or safety to express themselves, there are going to be lots of people who are going to say, nah, I don't like that guy. And I don't really feel, you know, I'm, yeah, we're all going into this church, but I don't really feel it. Things like that. Yeah, we, we're all into the science thing, but I don't really believe believe that's going to work. So you're going to have, so human beings are not monoliths. Another thing is that uh, human beings are, a, not only are we adaptable, but in most human beings are relegated to the arena of, of immense adaptability. And we, in our own uh, lifetime, in our own culture, we know human beings are adaptable because we live in some of the harshest places in the world. We've, for some reason, decided to domesticate and befriend um, lupines and felines, two of the most <laughs> most predatory animals <laughs> in the, in the uh, uh, living on the planet. Uh, we hunt things that are 10 times our body mass or larger, uh, whales and buffalo and elephants and rhinoceros and things. So we know, despite the fact that human beings are sometimes aren't the, the brightest people, that we're also very inventive and figure out ways to um, solve problems. Uh, lastly, uh, time, energy, resources. I bring that up a lot. A, a lot. It's, it's like my triangle, my... Uh, triangle philosophy. Uh, if given enough time, energy, or resources, human beings can solve a lot of problems. And sometimes in the course of solving those problems, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, in the course of solving those problems, sure, there are, there are stumbles, there are miscommunications, there are misconceptions involved in it, but human beings will solve a problem eventually. Uh, Zeb says, we're also capable of being stubborn, nigh on suicidally stubborn. You're absolutely right. Um, not just, and, and I'm going to add to that, not only are we stubborn, and near suicidal, but we also tend to do nearly, humanity tends to do things that are nearly suicidal um, 
in, in all regards, right? We will pump poison into our veins. We will breathe things in, eat things we shouldn't eat. Uh, darn near half the food that we eat in our own society, you start scratching your head like, who thought it was a good idea, for example, to brew coffee from, from the s butt weasels? Right, like who would somebody had to think of that, you know, be the first one to go, mm, this tastes good. And then the second person's gotta be like, you brewed coffee out of coffee beans from the from the feces of uh tree weasels. Like, yeah, I thought I would do that, you know. Uh so yeah, we're we're pretty we're pretty uh ignorant and stupid and we fumble, and so much much like a um uh, like in a mob, you're going to get people who are going to be on the outskirts of that mob. And those are ones that are, that are really going to modify how humanity uh, acts and reacts. And they're going to, they're going to figure out ways to get around things. Uh, Zev says, uh, I know a great many people who will stand on a sinking boat surrounded by sharks covered in lamb's blood and go, this is fine. I can fix this. <laughs> yeah, you sure do. So, I mean, oh man. Yeah. People are, are weird. I mean, we we are we are people who look at, at mountains and look at the top of them and go, yeah, I'm gonna get up there, and 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 <laughs> it's like, well, you can't breathe. It's gonna be cold. There's no one's gonna save you. You'll probably fall to your death. Yeah, it's all right. I'll yeah, I'll figure it out. <laughs> you know. Okay, so um, monoliths. Let's go back. Let's go into monoliths. Um, one of the things I think sometimes that we make a mistake on, and it's very easy to fall into it, is that. Uh, Human beings in, you know, individually, small groups, big groups, uh, masses of people, populations, uh, we tend to, we tend to organize them into monoliths. Uh, these people are very pious and religious. These other people live in the jungle and uh, they don't like strangers. Uh, these other people are uh, very intelligent and they create clockwork creations, and that's what they are. Uh, these people are, you know. Um, uh, historians and you know things of that nature. So, um, it, no matter how how organized the community is, no matter how um, rural or um, tribal a community is, no matter what, there's always going to be an exception. Um, just think about in our own lifetimes, right? If the those people that come from small towns, the younger they are, they're like, you know what, I'm going to get the hell out of this small town. And then you have people that live in big cities and there's sometimes the big cities like, I'm gonna get out of here and move to a smaller town, right? There's always going to be, there's always gonna be people who are, who don't wanna be part of that system. Um, I'm not, I don't know if any of you have heard, but we've heard of uh, PKs, uh, preacher's kids. You know, the, the more pious and uh, restrictive the preacher, the more wild their kids become. So you're always gonna have those who who buck the system, if for no other reason to be than to be a rebel without a cause, and those are the individuals that may be, you know, when you have a very lawful uh, region, you're going to have criminals. If you have a very criminalized region, you're going to have people who want to want to instill some kind of law and order, those kind of things. Uh, Zev says, uh, for all my comments on humanity being dumb or degenerates, don't be fooled, TBJ. I like people, but I like them like I like alcohol. <laughs> In short doses, anymore, and it leads to nausea and regret over my actions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. People, people do some weird and dumb things, but but you know, we as a as a group will try to solve problems, even if sorry, even if those problems don't come about in the way that we perceive. But let me give you an example. Um, take um, I, I, I'm go, I'm just doing this as a off the top of my head, so I'm not trying to to blast any particular culture. But for example, um, uh, Europeans sail over to Japan and they find, you know, they, or they sail over to India and they sail around the world and they go to an island and the people that live there find out that plague and disease is starting to spread. And so you're like, oh, you know, you nasty gaijin, we wanna kick you out. You need to leave our island, right? Because in their eyes, maybe they feel that these, um, Serpers, these invaders, these strangers are bringing to them death and destruction. Now, the reason, the logical reason might be well, it's because the rats that are on the ships are spreading disease. But the initial, we're kicking you off of our island because you're evil, 
would also solve that issue, right? We're going to kick your ships off our island, the rats leave, the disease stops spreading. So in many ways, solving the issue, solving the problem as humanity tries to solve it, it's not that they're wrong uh, in, in their ability to solve it. Hey, they're evil. We kicked them off the island. We're no longer sick. We were correct. But they tried to solve an issue. Hey, JP. Uh, but they tried to solve that issue by saying, hey, you need to leave our island. Now, later on, there may be sages or investigators or scientists of some sort or healers that go, well, you know what? It really wasn't them. It was the rats. But to solve that situation quickly and efficiently, they go, no, you've got to leave. So uh, that may be a cause for human humanity to solve a problem uh, quickly and immediately. Hey, we're being harmed or hurt or threatened or something's being taken away from us. You know, our fields are going fallow. Our children are being kidnapped. Our warriors are being killed off one by one by something. Uh, let's quit. Let's just let's cut that thing out of our lives to save us. And until we get an opportunity to, you know, look a little deeper into why that was happening. Um, Zeb says, we will solve problems even if there is no problem, especially if, especially if there is no problem. There's a lot of that too. But uh, again, making humans a threat, I think sometimes we, we in our, let's say, um, uh, we tend to make humans dumber than they are without them having the opportunity to try to solve the problem on their own. So, uh, we, you know, a lot of times we bring up the, the village being threatened by an enemy on the outside or even in modern society, right? It's the, we're, we're going to call the cops to try to solve a problem and we don't know what we're doing, you know? Whereas, you know, when there's a burning building, People don't just run scared and just go, oh, my God, oh, my God. People do things. What do, what do we do? We take out lawn chairs and we watch from the outside. We call our friends and family. Uh, people will drop their kids out of windows. Sometimes people will run back into the building because they want to save their loved one. Others will run up to the rooftop um, out of desperation. Others will try to get sheets and try to climb down. Out the, like people won't. People don't just stand around and wait for quote unquote, the authorities to solve the situation. They will do things in what they consider to be their best interest, right? Um, so Zeb says, you call it dumber than they are. I call it a sudden burst of intelligence, <laughs> both. And and strangely enough, we, we do both sometimes at the exact same time, right? Um, th that That is a thing. So there are human beings that are both exhibit um, great bursts of cowardice and stupidity and selfishness. At the same time, you're going to have those who, who never thought themselves to be heroes who will jump forward into a fray, um, challenging people and doing things that would normally not normally in their lifetime, you would think that they would never do perform certain actions. So yeah, JP says, uh, um, uh, Jared says, sometimes the ideology a bunch of humans hold can make them dangerous. Pretty heavy stuff in this modern age. Uh, it's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that with ideology. Sometimes I think it can give people a strength that completely overrides their, their instinctual need to run or flee or what have you. Um, for example, you, you could claim, and uh, again, I'm not, I'm not, um, criticizing, but you could claim that someone's devotion to an ideal, a religion, a political thought, not only just overrides their common sense, but actually will override their ability to, uh, their ability to ignore what fear and pain and um, morality and such. You, you can have an ideology that will have people walk straight into fire, um, will kill their own loved ones, uh, will sacrifice children, um, will have them step off of, you know, 200 foot ledges and fall to their deaths. I mean, sometimes we can, we, we have, 
not we have the singular ability as human beings to override our very instincts of pain and suffering and loyalty and you, you know we we can override our ability to consume food we will starve ourselves to death we will override our ability to um sacrifice our lives um burning ourselves drowning falling to our deaths um cutting ourselves open um, uh, walking into into gunfire, <laughs> we've we we've done that. In, you know, when when firearms were first used, hey, everybody gather together and walk straight ahead and let's shoot each other across a field uh, and have random lead shots just bounce around everyone. You know, th those were things. Um, cutting off other people's limbs to try to save those limbs and living to tell about it. You know, we, we're. We, we're pretty, we're pretty nasty as a whole. We're pretty nasty. So game wise, um, oh, um, no monoliths, uh, time, energy, and resources. You know, I, I get that there is a big divide amongst us in role playing, uh, in the role playing circles, our, us, our tabletops about whether there should or shouldn't be, or whether you allow or wouldn't allow, uh, firearms into medieval you know, into your medieval gaming. Some people are just dead set against it. Some people don't like it. Uh, others are like, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It doesn't matter what side you fall on, right? But I would argue that that when people make the example of, well, if there's magic, there would never be firearms, right? There would never be the, the development of them. Or the opposite that, you know, hey, if there's alchemy, there will be some... I, I would argue that neither of those prove anything, right? Because we don't have magic today. So if we had magic alongside our technology, would technology fall to the wayside? My, my feeling is in a world where there are threats that the average human being doesn't have access to, they're going to come up with so many other ways to, to protect themselves from dangers and whether that danger are storms, uh, th that danger could be earthquakes or uh, insects and you know disease. Humans are going to figure out something, some method, uh, for good or bad, that will protect them. If that means sacrificing virgins into a, a, a volcanic, <laughs> you know, mountain to keep the mountain from exploding, they're going to do it. If that means um, getting everyone together in the in the town square and stoning one innocent person by picking a um, a, a lottery ticket, and if that if they feel like that's going to solve the problem, they're going to figure out how to solve it. And eventually, through um, through <laughs> I hate to say the scientific method, through uh, you know cause and effect, they're eventually going to figure out. Oh, you know what? If we take this plant and take the, the aloe out of the plant and smooth it on our skin, uh, we won't get sick. You know, they're eventually going to figure that out. Uh, Zevron says, in a world of, uh, of, of uh, boulets, yeah, bullets, uh, wyverns, primordial magic, gods, elves, and dwarves, we are desperate to make our, our spot on, on the map, our spot in time. Of course, uh, elves can become Gandalf-level archmages and centuries, so we need to find or create new spells that that changes the system of magic before we die, or a magic item that can cause the empire to last an extra century or two. And and I would even go so far as to say that that in many ways we we'll we can default to very mundane things that are going to help us last a little bit longer, especially in. One driving force of people is legacy, um, leaving something for their children, for their family, for their community, for their political ideals, for their religious ideals. People, humans will want to leave their mark on society, even as individuals. I want to be, I want to leave my mark to let other people know that I lived a, a full and grand life, no matter what that life is. Um, and so we we will do things to to extend our history, um, no matter what that history will be. So, for example, in classic Dungeons and Dragons, I brought up the fact uh, yesterday. I'll bring it up again today that when there's magic, human beings are going to do things to stop them becoming victims of widespread magic, depending on how widespread that magic is in your world. Um, 
will, will they know what magic is? Of course. They will see it. Now, they may not be able to understand it, but confiscating spell books, um, limit, limiting the access to material components, um, having, you, you know, uh, clasping the hands and binding the mouths and blindfolding, you know, people who look like they are uh, wizards are, will be a thing. Using guard dogs or uh, what are like, birds canaries being taken down into the the underworld you know for lack of oxygen there will be animals that are probably going to be sensitive to magical emanations or the smell of bat guano so they don't get a fireball cast in their city or something right you, humans are going to figure that out and if for no other reason uh they're going to use very mundane activities to stop that kind of stuff they're you, you know uh, the 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 small child whose eyes glow green whenever magic is cast around them, they're going to have that individual, you know, use that individual to protect themselves from uh, magic for good or bad. They're going to have religious institutions that are, that are there to defend themselves uh, against interlopers who stand on the castle walls. And when visitors come inside, you know, they're going to hold them inside of, you know, um, oh, like, um, like security at uh, at some banks. You ever go into a bank where there's a security door, and so you you can you can only enter into one door because the other door remains locked, and you can't exit the second door until the first door locks behind you. I'm sure that's gonna. Why wouldn't they use the double portcullis idea? Where okay, strangers, you gonna you want to come into our town? First, come into the locked room, the locked area or region. Maybe can hold two people or 20 people or 200 people, right? You're, hey, you're going to come in here, but we're going to investigate the hell out of you. We're, we're going to sniff you out. We're going to use magic. We're going to use uh, someone who can detect your thoughts. We're going to use animals and dogs or whatever to sniff out. We're going to go through your back, backpacks or something to figure out how, what will keep us safe due to whatever threats are coming to, to those people from the outside. Now, the safer the humans, you know, they're not going to be as paranoid, but if there's a city of, of, of if, if magic is being used to usurp their, their um, safety, they're going to figure out ways to get around it. Uh, even if it means if they see someone using their hands or saying words that even remotely seem like it's magic, they might come down, down on you like a ton of bricks to stop you. You know what I mean? Um, Jared says, or on the opposite end, the, the McDonaldization of magic. <laughs> yeah, McDonaldization. Got to get a t-shirt for that. Uh, schools of magic are like the, the mega course from uh, Shadowrun. Um, I, I, I could see that as well. They're going to, you know, punching out eight and ninth and 10th level wizards might not be a thing, but how fearful will it be to punch out 50 very, uh, 50 specialist, right? You, you have a school of detection where all they do is, you know, they just teach students one or two spells to detect magic or thoughts or, you know, detect good and evil or something of that nature. Or you're going to have, you, you know, um, street gangs that, that only cast like, I don't know, um, uh, fire and cold or something like that or, or what have you. Like, the, um, the, the local mage who learns only to cast the light spell or dancing lights or something to so that uh, the streets are illuminated. You know, the, you that's kind of where Eberron came from, where magic isn't high or low, but, but it's broad and it's used to modify humanity's ability to live. And so, no, maybe a mage doesn't become fifth level, but there might be 20 mages that are like zero level, where they cast like light spells or comprehend languages or what is that floating disc or something like that to help humanity um, do what they can do. Like for example, why wouldn't a first level mage have a tensor's floating disc with like, you know, I don't know how, how many, how much weight it can hold. Like let's assume it's five tons of rock or something. And when visitors come in, they use the disc to put giant stones on top of it. And if, 
if any of those people are, you know, seen as criminals or shape changers or something, they just drop the stones on top of everyone. And that might be their way of defending themselves when people come into town. Why wouldn't they do that? Um, any number of things. Maybe familiars are used as um, a, as an alert system to fly fly on the outskirts of the city or off the castle walls to, you know, to look for enemies and such. <laughs> Zevron says... Uh, the, the McFireball is back for hold on, I gotta say it right. Um, um, the McFireball is back for a limited time only. Get it while it's hot, hot, hot. <laughs> yeah, the McFireball. <laughs> do, 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 do. Anyway, a, a group of diviners ask every day, Is the Empress or Emperor going to die this week, every week until they get a yes? You know what? Why wouldn't they? Why that makes perfect sense. The, the king or queen is uh, surrounded by a uh, vizier's or seers or something. And every, like you say, every single week they ask, when am I, when am I going to die? Or will I die this week? And you know, the, the oracles get together and, blah, 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 and they're over the pools of water or flaming embers or their eyes roll in the back of their heads. And they go, you will not die this week. Great. Thank you. You know, um, that would be, be just as common as the individual that, the, the food taster to make sure the king doesn't or queen doesn't eat poison food, you know? Uh, Zevron says, <laughs> then they nail it down to the exact second and exact day so they can prepare and society isn't surprised or hurt. Um, makes perfect sense to me. And now, mind you, all these things we're talking about, right? Diviners. Um, it may, okay, I'm, I'm going to bring up something else as well. Uh, um, foreshadow. If you're going to incorporate this into your world, Try to figure out a way to foreshadow these things, elements to your player characters. Don't surprise them. Like, uh, for example, who's to say that over a period of a long legacy of time that there haven't been defenses set up? For example, uh, player characters and other visitors come into town. When they go into the gates of the town, let's say there's, the, the again, the double closed doors, the double portcullis. There's a big giant circle on the ground. And when you step into it, it's anti-magic, right? They um, maybe it, maybe the current regime didn't create it, but it was there. It was left there from 250 years ago. And this big giant circle, when visitors walk in, it's anti-magic. Why? Maybe they were attacked by something like lycanthropes or shape changers or um, uh, uh, um, animated beings or something like that and the anti-magic circle keeps them from being attacked and reveals the true you, you, you know it reduces the um maybe their defenses or something so they can feel really find these people's true form now in modern era maybe sh they're not being attacked by shape changers at this period of time but maybe in the past they were attacked by it and so the legacy of these anti-magic circles still exists so when the players come into town, maybe it affects them differently. They're not shape changers, but it reveals, maybe it cancels out the magic they normally would have had. And so, you know, instead of surprising the PCs and going, ha ha, anti-magic circle, <laughs> you know, instead of doing that, maybe that's a thing that they have. You know, humans would, maybe they walk around with golems like, iron golems that are that are uh you know magic coal is shoveled into their chests or into their backs and they walk around with like smoke stacks you know coming out of their heads or off their chests or something um and the city guards just walk around with animated armor or golems or something or like i said before like instead of just regular dogs maybe maybe the people domesticated wargs or uh death's head dogs or uh, Blink dogs or displacer beasts, some of my favorite, uh, hellhounds or what have you. Uh, maybe the city is run by a necromancer who, quote unquote, is being good and trying to protect their people and became a necromancer. And so the, you know, the, the non combatants uh, drape, you know, uh, oils and uh, wrap their their dead loved ones who are standing on the castle walls and defending the population as undead warriors. And periodically they clean them off and try to preserve their bodies from deteriorating into zombies and then skeletons or whatnot. And so it could be a, a cultural thing where they wrap their bodies and things. Zerf says, um, uh, 
but then you find out the Procullus absorbs the magica essence of, of whoever steps on it and it's siphoning this energy, feeding maybe something, feeding something in the, in, in the city or feeding powerful, I don't know, energy rods that, that are used to, you know, cast out blasts of, you know, magical energy, magic missiles or bolts of fire or lightning or something. Except <laughs> since my old nerd is coming out calling it Magicka. <laughs> no, you're, I, I no, I, I prefer Magicka over magical. Yeah, but no, I hear you. JP says, uh, yeah, man, if there were ghosts and goblins and pixies all over the place, I totally have some magical ver um, vermin wards. Yeah, may, humans, since we're adaptable, they would make friends or at least partial treaties with those things that are around them. Um, why wouldn't they, if a city is filled with, with vermin and rats, on one hand, you could see them finding some kind of alchemical thing to, to keep the rats away, maybe, or magic, or some kind of scent, or um, humans, humans bred dogs and brought in weasels to track down rats, right? So we would find things to get the rats out the city. Or, or we go the opposite. We train them. We figure out how to utilize them for our own our own uses. We we don't fight them. We embrace their use. Um, for example, cobras and rattlesnakes are dangerous. So what have we done? There are people out there kissing the noses of alligators. There are people who are who are um, <laughs> you know sticking their hands down into the mouths of fish. We have people who are out in the open seas, you know, going after swordfish and and whaling and all those kind of things. We're pretty we're we're pretty wild. Oh, Caius, hey, what's going on there, man? Caius of Glantry, by the way. Um, uh, Caius is a uh, notable member of uh, Absolute Tabletop and uh, other Facebook groups, always brilliant. So thank you for joining me. He says, uh, there are notices at the gates to warn visitors that the entire city is protected by forbidden spells. So extra plane of travel and creatures cannot enter. Uh, magic mouths will call out if anyone dispels. Absolutely. Um, why wouldn't Human beings, we, we are not just adaptable, but we will do things to defend ourselves. And the greater the danger, or not just the greater the danger, the more immediate the danger, the more they will use those things to protect themselves. Sure, your outer villages that are 20, 30, 100 miles away, they're not going to know about those things. But the closer you get to major a major metropolitan area, the, the more common people with magic or magical effects are affecting a city. You know, one mage in a city is powerful. 30 mages is just chaos. And they're going to just, they're going to put a, put a stop to that, right? They're going to, you, you know, your first and second and third level wizards going in causing problems, charming people and things like that. They're going to put a stop to that. And sure, there might be doorways that are affected by that detect magic, like if you walk through the doorway, you glow a certain way. Or there might be proctors that walk around the city that are working with the city guard that you know use detect magic. Hey, this person robbed someone. See if their mind was affected by by uh, external magic. And they, yes, their magic, you know, their mind was charmed to make them rob this place. And, hmm. We have another usurper in here affecting people's minds. Um, pa pass around the, the tiaras to make sure that the guards are not affected by this or something. You know, I like the idea of magic mouths calling out if someone uses a, a cast magic or dispels it or what have you. Um, Zevron says, imagine a, imagine a magical school, literally a school or spell shop selling scrolls as spell wards or raid scrolls. Maybe they... Maybe they disseminate them to important people or merchants, or um, they sell them as wards to protect their their homes or their businesses. I, I could absolutely see that. I could see, I could see the captains of the guards pulling out a ring or a scroll or spilling out alchemical potions or chemicals on the ground or whatnot. Why wouldn't l let's say there are oozes? and uh, gelatinous cubes and, and um, uh, what is it, oozes, puddings. The, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, the green and the black and the, the ochre, uh, the, whatever. Um, who's to say that there aren't people walking around with those in bottles? And if you're, you walk into town and you look above you, 
why are there jars hanging from ropes <laughs> up up above us? And and you you start some trouble, and all they do is pull in a rope. They pull the rope hard enough, the 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 ceramic thing shatters, and a black ooze just falls right over your body. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, why why wouldn't they incorporate those things in their world? And I think they probably wouldn't. And it could be pretty dangerous as well. GP says, remember when you could detect alignment? <laughs> there was a lot of uh, uh, Alinus communities. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now, of course, alignment has fallen by the wayside, but there could be there could be detect intentions, you know, um, not just detect detecting your every thought, but detecting thoughts about threats to the nobles. Right. There may be, you, you know, almost like a limited form of some of those spells. There could be um, like was brought up earlier. There could be diviners or oracles that are like. They, they patrol the city for no other reason than to detect if you have any harmful thoughts towards the nobility or the oligarchies or whoever are controlling the city. And if you have any untoward thoughts for them, they arrest you. It'd be that as well. Um, Zev says, uh, an interesting thing is how humans put people in charge. We have so many forms of government. We have oligarchy, democracy, imperialism, <laughs> communism, etc. Why wouldn't we add a new? Why wouldn't we add new ones to this world? Um, um, uh, uh I presume, or majocracies, majoc. I think both would be possible. A majocracy and a magiocracy. Uh, whose magic, those with magic have power. The more magic, the more power. Uh, I absolutely agree with you there. Paladin orders that supervise society with their oaths. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think a mageocracy would be wizards would control. I think a may may a magiocracy would be not necessarily wizards, but those with magical aptitude. So there wouldn't be specific wizards, but there would be those with magical powers. So there might be let's say um let's say a bard a druid um a ogre magi a naga and a sphinx would might control the city <laughs> you know what i mean like you might have one of those kind of weird kind of things like there are five great magical beings one's a lich another one's a you know a fiend another one's a, a celestial like you might have something like that as well uh kaya says servants of the state volunteer themselves to become intelligent magic weapons or other items and these magic items sit on council and serve and, and only serve the loyal Ooh, that sounds so it's not the person but the person who can wield the item maybe the 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 it's like a legacy item of sorts um hell in guildmaster's guide to ravnica you have a council of ghosts that exists in in the world and remember those ghosts can pass through walls they can possess people there there aren't too many there won't be too many people invading their town if you have a a council of ghosts it could be like i, I was saying before about the undead maybe maybe the undead do protect the city. I mean, if you're an outsider, yeah, the undead are evil and they would ravage you. But this one particular city, those people, maybe that undead type exists. They are restless undead because they want to protect their city. You know, almost uh, almost like, like a paladin's order, but like they've taken the oath to protect their city unto death, un unto death. So there could be ghosts and banshees and other things, but they are restless spirits who, even in, even after they've died, they still take up their weapons to protect their city from uh, from evil people like you, you know, invaders or something. Um, Zev says maybe the Lord of the realm becomes a spirit in death if they did a good job and their goal in life is to be as good as their predecessors. Yes, uh, there could be the idea that it's not necessarily an afterlife in the traditional sense of going to another world, but the afterlife might be serving their community eternally um, until maybe someone of a worthy of worthy ability allows them to move on to the quote unquote afterlife to to heaven or nirvana or something. Dead Man Storyteller says, like the ancient order from the Star Wars or the pre pre-Sith times. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm I'm gathering that there are 
like spirits of sorts that remain uh, maybe in a p particular position as guards or as advisors um, or as kings or queens or nobles or something that keep their position until others can um, can come about and take those positions as well. <laughs> Zeb says, and once they are a spirit, they live in the halls of the lords and ladies, spending their afterlife as valued advisor. I absolutely agree with you on that. And again, foreshadowing, like like Caius uh, mentioned before, uh, like like Caius mentioned before, maybe there are things posted outside the the walls of the city, or maybe there are how do I explain this? There are patrolling groups, defenders of the, of the city that tell people, visitors, before they get to the town that's five miles away, understand that your very, you know, your very spirit, your very mind uh, will be questioned when you come to the town. Those, you know, whatever words are said or given to people, you know, to, to tell them that, yeah, this city's protected by basically spirits of our ancestors. Uh, don't disrespect. Um, Jared says, quote, Timmy, you better not tell a lie or the skeletons will get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the crypts of the dead might be there not just for their honor, but but maybe the people open up the crypt doors to allow their their ancient ancestors to walk around and uh, defend them uh, in, in a time of need. Uh, Zeb says, a king asks his great, great, great grandmother and, and father, the creators of the city, should we impose this new law? And they answer truthfully, or they answer, humanity might not have the answer, but these beings that have existed for a long time might very well have the answer. And you know, we don't have to deal with spirits and undead as, as well. We can go with fey creatures, giants, um, other kinds of monsters, for example, like gargoyles that are normally uh, brutal and evil. Maybe those gargoyles are fed enemies of the state. And in return, those gargoyles sit upon the parapets and defend the city. And those gargoyles might not even be, you know, they might not be bestial with horns or teeth or something. Those gargoyles might actually come from, uh, from, sculptors who sculpt ancient heroes with wings of like angelic wings or bat wings or butterfly wings or something. And each one is then set upon the parapets of the city and each one represents a, a great hero or something. And they come alive and defend the city or something. Um, uh, Kaya says to reduce chaos, no private ownership of spell books is allowed. Spells are memorized <laughs> um, as state controlled huge obelisks. I love that idea. We, we, now we did that on a world building uh, video too, where the spells aren't in spell books themselves, or the spell books are behind, let's say, uh, magically encased, like, like, um, glass or gemstone or something and so you can't physically touch the spell book but you can put your hands inside of gloves that can flip the books back and forth so you can't remove the spell books from whatever wall of force or whatever it is that's hiding them but you can you can absolutely learn the spells but if you want to come back and re-memorize them you have to work for the state and you have to come back here to get those spells. I love that idea. I could even imagine the spells being written on the wall, like you say, obelisks or the walls of the inner of the inner city. And so you might have the inner walls of the, the nobility where you have 10, 15, 30 spell casters who pray before these walls or study the walls and hold hands. They read the spells and then they go out on the castle walls and they're able to blast their enemies before they're they're overtaken. Um, you know, there's also things, you know, we're, of course we're talking about magic and things, but we can, we can make it even f a little bit less so. Like, for example, um, we can, you know, you have the, the idea of having mounts or specially trained animals that do things. Why not have magical creatures that, that are, part of the city, you know, where, where they're rats and we get weasels. Why not? Why wouldn't we have dinosaurs or beasts, the magical beasts? Like I brought up blink dogs before, or, uh, I don't know, flaming bats or, uh, f you know, scorpions and serpents and things like that. And just, why wouldn't, why wouldn't people, 
you know, uh, learn how to domesticate giant spiders and 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 um, climb on the back of the spiders as either you, you know mounts or maybe they're maybe they're even larger and there's 20 people that can ride on a on the back of giant spiders that can easily walk over the castle walls and uh, defend them defend the people from uh, from uh, enemies. Uh, Zephron says <laughs> says you then have magic shows where you can go through loop loopholes and get l illegal spells. Oh, they say you need to be a certain age, but you can get anything for the right cost. <laughs> How old are you? 12? And you want fireball? 200 gold. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, there's always an exception to the rule. Maybe this city is so well protected by magic that there is an that there is an underground. There's a black market of, of scrolls or gemstones or um, potions or something that allows you to temporarily bypass the magical defenses. Hey, if you wear like, hey, if you wear this, um, if, if you wear this ring, you can bypass the the ever watching spirits that are that stand upon the castle walls. And so maybe it's an idea. This, the idea is that the players must um, like a heist. They have to obtain certain keys to unlock certain doors not literally unlock them but for example that maybe there's a um, uh, there's a certain uh, hood if you wear the hood over your face you, you know you can't see but then the ghost can't see you and then there's a magical key that unlocks the the magically locked doors or maybe there's illusions that hide the doorways to get to the inner sanctum of the nobility or the oligarchy you know there's a maybe there's illusions that that hide those those regions i even want this is a strange thing to, to come up with but maybe there's an illusion of there's an illusion of a um a, what's that thing a drawbridge and if you believe the illusion you can walk across the drawbridge and enter in but if you disbelieve it you'll fall through the, the drawbridge and and so the player characters who love disbelieving illusions can't go across the drawbridge so they got to figure out how to cross go across the moat that's filled with some kind of dangerous animals or something at the bottom whereas the regular humans that w live there are just like oh it's just a drawbridge let's walk across <laughs> wakanda forever <laughs> Oh, I'm Bombay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, hell yeah. Um, th hey, that's a the, uh, Wakanda. That's a that's a place that used uh, you you could easily replace the technology with magic or replace it with psionics or whatever. Where they very they live in harmony with their their abilities. They have the the border tribe and they take their cloaks and if they take their cloaks they create a shield that you know protects their borders and then there's the the dora malaje that protect their king why wouldn't i mean humanity might have that as well um, where they have one maybe only like a handful of special traits that allows them to defend themselves um also Humans would make, uh, I brought this up before, humans would make treaties. <laughs> yeah, I want that magic item, the cloak shield. Hell yeah. Hey, man, I want 500 of those and pass them to 500 of your closest friends. <laughs> um, but but again, um, I could imagine humanity be f um, utilizing the things that are around them. So maybe instead of guard dogs, they have saber tooth tigers or lions or they use cheetahs to help them hunt. They... Um, um, they, instead of being attacked by giant rocks or griffins up, up on the highest parapets, they, they have trainers that feed them and maybe they're not exactly domesticated, but they are, the wild animals are encouraged to live around the city to help defend them because they know that's where they get their food. Like for example, um, uh, the player characters come towards the city and they're like, why are there all these giant sized mole holes all around the city? And it could be that the city encourages, you know, bullets living, you know, boulets, whatever, bullets living, uh, land sharks <laughs> living in and around their city. And they basically like feed them or help them breed or protect their, I don't know how they breed. Maybe they, they become these like little roll balled up stones or so. I don't know how they breed, but whatever the case may be, maybe they cultivate them and, you, you know, of course, they might cultivate them at a distance, right? But maybe they, they allow them to grow. Maybe the city 
has some kind of weird um, alliance with elemental spirits. And so the city is surrounded by this elemental air and water and fire spirits that, that you know, the flame shoots out from the ground or, or storm clouds come out from the sky and lightning bolt strikes from the sky because they are, they honor the spirits uh, either religiously or maybe there are wizards towers where uh, they look to instead of tele instead of telescopes looking to the sky, they have like telescopes that look to other dimensions and they are able to draw them, you know, draw power from these other dimensions, at least temporarily. Uh, Zevron says in my Egypt setting, the Druids that worship the scorpion goddess of healing and venom by domesticating giant scorpions, perfect, uh, uh, absolute perfect thing. Maybe the people here are use buckets of mundane scorpions and dump them into the streets and the humans that, you know, that live here, they're used to seeing scorpions run run all over the place. Maybe they cultivate giant scorpions, or they're able to take the poison from from cobras and use utilize that to create like healing potions in a way. It's like the uh, the the people eat and drink little amounts of poison, making them resistant or immune to certain poisons, and so. While there's highly poisonous to strangers, the people that live here who maybe eat eat the scorpions and the venom from from uh, from the cobras and whatnot, uh, it's just a normal thing. Who's to say that the average person that lives there doesn't have a basket by their front door where a cobra or a rattlesnake or something is inside of it? And that's just a normal thing. Um, Kaya says land sharks would be hell for foundation. <laughs> it sure would, man. It sure would. Um, <laughs> maybe that was a bad example. <laughs> unless, wait a minute, unless they take bullets with them, the, the land sharks with them, and use them to attack other places, <laughs> right? Maybe there are... Maybe there's a hypnotic sound that lulls them to sleep, or maybe there's a smoke. And if you burn certain herbs, herbs and spices, it makes them very docile. And so that's how they keep them under control. And then they just take them in cages and let let the 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 the, the whatever they feed them, the land sharks that makes them docile, they take them to the other realm, they leave and they just let them go. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty nasty. Uh, oh, Zevron says their armor is scorpion plating, an extra strong carapace for medium to heavy armor. I, I love that. You, you know, of course, we love ourselves some dragon armor, taking dragon skill. But why wouldn't they use scorpion, the, the carapace of insects like scorpions or beetles? Or why not use the people that live by an ocean? Why wouldn't they use um, um, like... Human beings, but operating like um, oh, why did my brain forget it? What's what's the little what's the the little crustacean that moves its rear end into a shell? And uh, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a little crustacean, and its its backside is very sensitive and vulnerable, so it always finds empty shells. The hermit crab. Thank you, JP. Yes, the hermit crab. Who's to say that humanity? doesn't make armor like a hermit crab. Like they they actually go out into the, a coastal city goes out into to find like clam shells or something like that. Maybe they use like three foot clam shells and turn them into shields. Maybe they, instead of like plate mail armor, they find these like hermit crab type armor where shells where they, they use straps and, and hook it on their back or they're able to kind of insert their body into it. And sure, they might look a little bit silly, but maybe it's very defensive. Uh, maybe there's some kind of animal that dies, and if it's smoked or treated with oils or something, that it becomes a type of armor. For example, like uh, using like alligator skin. You know, if you if you cut the skin a certain way, you can make alligator boots. And maybe there's a you know, this is a medieval, maybe a fantastical world. You can make something far thicker or just as thick as leather armor, but it's made out of, you know, alligator skin or something of that nature. I mean, you can go so far with these things. Maybe uh, humanity has developed not just flight, but maybe like gliding. So they use 
the feathers from the giant rocks that live in the region on the mountains. So they take the feathers and they make them, they put them into um, uh, harnesses and frameworks that allow them to fly or at least glide from, you, you know, parapet to parapet in their own towering city in the mountains or something. Um, Kaya says, you don't have, you don't become an adult or warrior until you survive the giant scorpion sting. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. And, and again, we can re we can reskin the races in our world to be something else. So let me give you an example. We know in fifth tr traditional fifth edition that dwarves have like resistant to resistance to poison. They don't have to be dwarves. They could just be human beings that happen to have a resistance to poison. And instead of stone cunning. Maybe they have some, you replace that with something else. So instead of stone, maybe it's like um, survival in the de desert. And instead of, what's something else that dwarves have? Um, instead of dark vision, maybe it's, you change that to uh, sensitivity to vibration. So they can just put their ear or their hand in the sand of, of this desert region where there's scorpions and such, and they can feel the vibration of uh, an invading tribe three miles away. And someone else is like, I don't feel anything. I don't hear anything. But the, the, the human, air quotes, human being can reach their hand into the sand and feel the, the, the whirling dervishes that are two miles away. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Zevron says, I've always heard it pronounced as boule. It is, it is pronounced boule. Uh, originally, it was a, it was pronounced boule because of a fake French pronunciation. So yes, <laughs> Dead Man says the Tarasque hide armor. Uh, you, you, okay, Dead Man, you got, you got to point everybody to the video that I did uh, for, um, Salt in Wounds, a very long. It is a Kickstarter that is very long and coming for a setting about a community built around constantly killing a Tarasque. Uh, and yeah, I did a video on the eh, kind of a review page through kind of thing. It's, it's kind of, I, I think it's a kind of a cool setting. And I think they just released, J, J. M. Perkins just released the player's guide. So I might do another review on it. I'm not sure yet. Uh, Zev says, um, says, granted, the only DM I had that used them was, uh, was French Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The original creators, uh, searched on YouTube, one of the original creators of the Boulet, specifically said it was pronounced boule uh which is why we prefer uh land shark jared says tim cask the original creator has confirmed boule yes tim cask sorry about that so uh yes it is boule uh which we're just like boule <laughs> really really because they're pretty dangerous as creatures with a with, with a strange uh name but <laughs> whatever um but again we're we're here talking about tips and tricks. We kind of floated and floated in and out into other things, but human beings are very very industrial. We are stupid, we're ignorant, we are devious, we are, but we're also very adaptable. And I think it behooves us not to make the typical we're villagers and we need help and we don't know what we're doing to give them some form of not intelligence, but proactivity. And that now being proactive doesn't necessarily mean that it makes them any more brilliant or even that the idea that they can defend themselves is even better. But the village that's defending itself from the tr traditional goblinoid horde is not just going to be sit back and go, we keep getting attacked and we don't know what we're doing. They're going to try to parlay with them. They're going to try to make deals. They will use spies. They will try to defend themselves in many ways. Maybe they will burn if they're being attacked and their livestock is being stolen and their food is being stolen. Maybe they poison their own crops. Maybe they try to sneak their livestock and hide their livestock and their food resources so they can survive the winter. Maybe they try to try to blend with their, if they can't beat them, join them. Maybe they try to find a way to convince to dis not distract, but move the goblinoid horde to find other victims. Maybe the, the, the entire village packs up and leaves. You know, we they're going to do things other than just sit there 
in one spot and go, we don't, we need heroes. We don't know what we're doing. They are going to find something. Now it might not work. And you can play through that where more and more of their people are dying. But yes, human beings will do something, whether it means sending out their best warriors. Maybe they, they try to hire hunters to hunt them down. Maybe they try to build a wall that may or may not make sense. <laughs> Zevron says, my Wi-Fi makes no sense. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're referring to this, but but um they're they're made hell. Well, that's going down another deep rabbit hole of like a magical Wi-Fi. I don't I know you're thinking you brought up something else, but it just made me think of a of an arcane Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, you're saying sometimes it turning it off is better than my modem. Yeah, yeah. Um oh, it is is it the hour mark, babe. Hey, you too, babe. Love you. Yeah, and I'll be here too. So we'll do the, the the yard work outside. So I'll be here with it. All right, love you. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the hour mark. Wife goes off to work. I <laughs> I got to get ready as well. As everyone says other times I like now. To, yeah, yeah. I, we we always have. The, I don't know. It's it's electronic foibles, I guess. Uh, which for some reason we don't add those foibles into magic where odd things happen or odd there's odd residual effects of them that's something else we can talk about residual effects of magic that we we tend to ignore we normally think of it as on and off switches um <laughs> kaya says or at least build a palisade or a moat or a bailey uh okay i'm gonna i know what a palisade is i'm thinking if you're thinking of a moat if you're thinking of the other spelling of a moat, like M O A T, a big ring, depression around a castle. I don't know what a Bailey is. Um, <laughs> could you imagine magical tech support? <laughs> that would be awesome. I love that. I dude, that's that is a great idea. Magical tech support. <laughs> you have people in the city like, listen, my my storm. My storm cloud shower isn't working. I go inside of it and I try to get it to, to rain so we can wash up and then turn into a to a tornado to dry me off, but it just keeps shooting electrical bolts. <laughs> and the mage is there like pulling out the thing. They show up in one of those um in, in one of those uh um geek squad like uh, wagons with a geek squad symbol on the side, comes out like, hmm, let's see, let's open up the book here and <laughs> I love that idea, man. Zeb says a wizard doing a magic, um, a magic uh, kulento, uh, cast purify food and water. <laughs> one, one one candle is uh, rotated wrong. <laughs> yep. uh, Zeb says oh, this causes three other things to not work. Yeah, I could see that happening too. Uh, Jared says it will only polymorph the ducks. <laughs> Whole family running around as ducks quack, quacking. They're just like, I just want my family back. <laughs> Tesla Ranger says, have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, JP says, I can't turn off this fairy fire. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Oh, man, that, that would be hilarious. Oh, you guys are making me cry. Oh, man. That's, uh, you know what, guys? I... As as I as silly and tongue in cheek and stuff, I think that I think that would be a perfect little aside in the story. That I think that makes a, that makes a lot of sense, though. That would that would be really great. Where where the the cities the people in the city use magic, but it just doesn't work right sometimes, and they're not panicked by it. It's just a thing that happens. <laughs> They 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 see they see old man Whitaker running down the street chasing after the ducks and the people outside sitting on the porch is like yep family turned into ducks again that's what I, that's what these old these young folk with their magic and their arcane hey! always <laughs> it would just be hilarious oh man the other lady the old lady down the street surrounded by fairy fire she just stops she does she doesn't even bother anymore she just just randomly fairy fire going around her body like yep. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to lock my house, and now there's a portal to a ba Baylor. <laughs> the Baylor's like, "Would you please stop summoning me? <laughs> Trying to get some sleep here." <laughs> no, I don't want to come to your world. <laughs> please, to stop bothering me. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, Doctor Strange. When one, when one, 
his hand shields fizzles out and <laughs> yeah what, what's the thing <laughs> that's what we use as a toilet oh man yeah <laughs> tesla made magic magic bucklers oh that would be sweet Ma uh, a magic a shield on your arm that's just nothing but a portal to another realm that's awesome i love that idea i mean you could now now theoretically you could just be silly and just go well these people just have air quotes shields to add plus to their armor class but if it protects them it actually goes to another place and in, in, in another realm you know if they if they get the shield in front the spear the spear actually goes into the shield and pokes into like some winter wonderland or something like that oh man <laughs> yeah so it says just hit the spell book and it should work fine and got it. <laughs> Storyteller says a, a moat, M-O-T-T, -T, a mound or hill typically used to build a castle on and a bailey, a precursor to a castle. Thank you very much, because I'm not very smart. Um, although I could I could I could quite easily look it up, but then I'll get top headed. But yes, oh, so a moat is a mound or a hill, as I'm pre I'm presuming it's pronounced moat as just like the M-O-A-T moat, which is the big giant dugout circle around a, a castle uh tradition i'm uh, not traditionally but cinematically um uh so it's a big giant hill you basically build up a, a mound or a hill and then build a castle on it so you're always you always have the you're always at a at a um height advantage over your enemies so they have to climb up a hill oh it's called a J jp says modem bailey castle old style fort oh, okay Oh, a mot, pronounced M-A-H-T, like mot, a mot. Hmm. Okay, uh, I've I've never heard it referred to. I all these years of role playing and castles and Dungeons and Dragons, I've never heard that re reference. I I don't know why I've never heard it. I've just never heard it. Um, he says a bailey is a precursor to a castle. So a bailey is like a like the medieval version of a medieval castle. Like be, before there was a castle, it is, if you lived in a time where castles existed, a bailey is a thing that happened before them and they would consider that to be a med medieval, I'm presuming. But and anyway, yes, This the, the rest of this week, we are of course talking humans. Humies, your average people, are they a threat? What do they do? What, how can we use them? So of course, tomorrow's World Building Wednesday, so we're going to world build with, with our humans. Kind of, We kind of did that today. Um, of course, Third Pillar Thursday, we're going to talk about humans and human beings themselves as obstacles and part of exploration uh, pillar of gaming, that third pillar of gaming. Uh, humans being in the way, humans being a problem, humans being uh, not just cannon fodder, but humanity as a mass of people and also humans and the obstacles they create like castles like mots like moats like baileys and stuff like that and then uh of course future friday we're going to go into human beings in the future and how they are a threat to other aliens and how humanity handles being in a place with a lot of technology and stuff like that. Human, human, humans. Uh, Derek Cavan says, good stuff, thanks. Gets me ready for tomorrow, d, &D session. Yeah, that's all we do here is a long ass live streams that basically gets the, it's just, it's my way of getting the cobwebs out the head, out the head or at least getting ideas out the head that might be there because you have another idea you have in your head and we just get together throw out a bunch of stuff that we think other people could benefit from. And in a way, it's basically every day we world build. Um, so yeah, guys, thank you for, for joining me. Going a little late today. Um, thank you for being part of this, th th uh, this long, wide cast of individuals. Um, so thank you. Th again, thank you very much for being positive. Again, we're going to leave here. Uh, don't measure your loves by your hates. There's enough hate in the world. Um, yes, hate is easy. Hate is the dark side. Uh, we we can we have <laughs> yeah digital pizza and coffee <laughs> with, with with a mimic sitting at the table. Guys, thank you, thank you, dead man. Thank you guys for for um, educating me. Uh, I can always learn something new every day. Everyone have a great day. I will see thee tomorrow. See ya. Bye.